peculiar, but I'm also uh, more happy to be able to present uh, this discussion with these particular group of panelists. Uh, the role of media in, in Burma's path to democracy, uh, in some ways I think uh, this panel represents more uh, that the path to democracy wouldn't be possible without individuals like the four people who I have up here. Uh, each of them has their own particular uh, connection to the media or can shed light on the way in which media will be important uh, to either help or harm uh, Burma's path to democracy. Uh, and Burma, in a certain way, is a very specific and complicated country, but the, the topic of media does prevent, present a lens to look at all the events that have been taking place over the last year. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of people who have been surprised at the, the changes that have been taking place, or at least the changes that have been reported upon uh, in so many Western publications and so many diplomatic cables. Uh, each of them here represent, again, different parts of the political spectrum, different parts of the media sector, uh, and different parts of civil society. Uh, and when we look at the media, again, you can see certain things that, that are uh, kind of representative of the type of managed transition that's been happening in Burma. Uh, it's been incremental. It's not a major reform that's happened all at once. Uh, there have been ongoing promises about media reform, but at the same time, very few details and specifics that have been provided. Uh, and there's also been a use of the media for a particular type of targeted reconciliation uh, in the sense that they would try and get people involved in the process of reconciling with the government after the 2010 elections very selectively. Obviously, Aung San Suu Kyi representing the major figure that they tried to, to bring into the process, but also uh, using Aung Min, the railway minister, and now uh, one of the more powerful people in the cabinet uh, to try and do peace initiatives, trying to get some people back from cross-border organizations, one of whom uh, is here on the panel. Uh, and so even though I think the discussion here will branch out into things that are a little bit beyond just uh, the media and really look at kind of what is happening in Burma right now and what stage is it at towards a transition to democracy, uh, I would just like to, to thank everyone here and uh, also give everyone a chance to kind of represent what their particular connection is to it. Uh, just to give a very brief introduction, since you have information about all the panelists, uh, each panelist will have you know, five, seven minutes to kind of present their particular uh, response to the, the major questions about media and also the way in which their work connects to it. Uh, the order will be first, uh, Mr. Ulan Chang, who is uh, formerly an NLD spokesperson. He's actually been elected to parliament twice, first time in 1990, uh, once again in the by-election in 2012. Uh, but he's also you know, someone who is a very experienced journalist, a former political prisoner, uh, and again, through the different types of work he's done, has contributed to the path of democracy, uh, and he'll be the first speaker. Uh, the second speaker will be Mr. Koko G, uh, who is one of the 88 student generation leaders uh, and who spent over 18 years in prison for his uh, activism to try and push Burma towards a democratic outcome. Uh, he was in prison for a long time for his role in the 88, uh, 88, 88 uprising, uh, came out again in 2005 and then around the Saffron Revolution immediately threw himself into it again, uh, was sentenced to 65 years in prison but fortunately was released uh, in January of 2012, uh, though with conditions which you know again could be part of the, the Q&A because it is a, an interesting thing to make sure you look at how people are released rather than just they were released at all. Uh, the third speaker will be Mr. Ongzol, uh, who represents the, the Irrawaddy, uh, which is one of the main publications uh, that was published for a long time in exile, uh, making sure that the world had an idea of what was really going on in the country. Uh, because obviously Burma, uh, it's in Southeast Asia, not all of the world was paying attention. Uh, I'm an American and for a long time people used to say that America had the liberty of doing the right thing in Burma because people didn't know where it was. Uh, the Irrawaddy is one of the publications that helped make sure uh, people could pay attention to what was going on. Uh, and so he'll be speaking third. And then last we have uh, Chao Tu. He uh, is the director of Pangku, which is a civil society strengthening initiative inside. Uh, and especially at the current time as people start to think that, okay, maybe this opening is for real in comparison to some of the openings that took place in the 90s or some of the, the openness that started to show in around 2003 and then was cracked down so brutally in 2007 after the Saffron Revolution. He'll speak a little bit more about the role that civil society and civic initiatives are able to play. Uh, now, the, the big three topics, and again, they can be 
breached in lots of different ways. I think uh, it's important to look at not only the ways in which media could potentially help the path to democracy, but also the ways in which media can harm uh, Burma's path to democracy, because media is not always a positive force in a country like Burma. Uh, and so I'd like to, to start off with Wang Chang, if, if you would. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks for allowing me to state on the media and democracy in Myanmar, Burma. My special thanks also go to the organizers of the event and your organization, Peoples in Need. First of all, allow me to briefly introduce myself. My name is Ong Chang. I graduated from the Wall Press Institute, WPI, Journalism School, MacArthur Star College, Twin Cities, Minnesota, USA. I work as an editor of GMO newspaper, Handauri newspaper, and Botertown newspaper in the years of 1960 and 1980s. I was dismissed from the job for my active role in Quarter H General Strike. I became one of the Central Committee members of NLD led by Don San Suu Kyi. I was elected from our party at the Manly Southeast Constituency in 1990 multi party democracy election. I was elected again in the by election of 2012 at Maha Aumi Constituency, Manly. I used to be in prison for more than 16 years for being a top leader of National League for Democracy, which is powerhouse of democracy movements. Currently, I am working as head of information department of NLD and a spokesperson for both NLD and Don San Suu Kyi, our leader and my hero. If we look at the history of Burma in short, we can learn many lessons about the relationship between media and democracy. Burma, Myanmar regained, let's start our independence. Burma, Myanmar regained its independence in 1948. Journalists played a very important role in our independence. Our national hero, Kuang San had worked as an chief editor of magazine issued by Student Union of Rangoon University. Therefore, Parma, Myanmar, with the democratic government, stood as a dignified and fairly economically developed country for 14 years. Freedom of media in Burma during 1948 and 58 was high and at the top of the nations of Southeast Asia. The founding fathers of modern Burma greatly respected the role of media and its freedom. You thought, you know, everybody know, I think, at sometimes press secretary of the then, Prime Minister Unu was elected as the third secretary general of the United Nations at a time when the Cold War was intense. Burma's, Myanmar's famous son, Yutan, a journalist, successfully mediated and resolved Cuban crisis, saving the world from a nuclear war. Because of erratic history of the country, Burma, Myanmar fell under the dictatorship of General Nguyen in 1962. General Nguyen could not live in the light of democracy. He cracked down all those who opposed the dictatorship. Dictator General Nguyen made systematic plans to shut down free media to sustain his power. After free private newspapers and publications were shut down in 1969, Burma, Myanmar, fell into the dark age. And in 1974, Dictator General Nguyen transferred power to 
Parma Socialist Program Party, PSPP, which put the country under single party dictatorship system. PSPP is his own party. Therefore, he became a president elected by his own party, PSPP. That parliament is a robust parliament. Fear overwhelmed the country when there was no freedom of expression. Parma, which was once the top exporter of rice in Asia, became one of the world's poorest countries in 1988. The scarcity of food, public faced all sorts of troubles and nearly lost their destiny. Finally, people unanimously rose up against the single party system. The uprising that shocked the war did take place in Myanmar in 1988. People took part unanimously in that democracy movement. People toppled down three successive governments of single party dictatorship in two months. But military launched coup d'etat and crushed the uprising with force. The world did not know the truth because the media had been already shut down. Knowing that people would not accept the single party system again, military did a promise the country that multi party democratic system would be set up and political parties would be allowed to form. Over 200 big and small political parties appeared. Among those political parties, National League for Democracy, NLD, led by Ndo Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of National Leader General Aung San, became the strongest. Rallied around by ex-military leaders who stood by the people and well-respected intellectuals, Ndo Aung San Suu Kyi won the strong public support. Most significantly, as in her father's time, ethnic nationals admired and supported her. People considered Don San Suu Kyi to be the true successor of General Aung San. They believe it is replacement of General Aung San in their heart. Military regime announced in March 1989 that Maldi party elections would be held in May 1990. Then it planned to crack down the NLD. The regime addressed NLD leaders at the township, division, and central levels, alleging that. They committed crimes in the uprising. NLD leader Don San Suu Kyi strongly protested against that plan, claiming that political problem must be solved politically. She demanded to have dialogue with Slok military regime. Military regime planned to comfort, confront with NLD. The regime arrested top leaders such as ex-general Uten U, the, the chairman of NLD, and the famous journalist Seo Han Tauri Uwinti. Don San Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest. Military regime cracked down the NLD in many ways. Despite the suppression, NLD contested in Mali party democracy Elections held on 27 May of 1990 at the will of the majority of the people. I would say political awareness of our countrymen is very high. Therefore, NLD contested for 485 seats in the whole country and won 392. It is a landslide victory with 82.2 percent we got.
conference was held with the winning MPs of NLD and MPs from the national ethnic parties. The conference is known as Gandhi Conference because it was held at the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Hall in Rangoon. The MPs at the conference signed an announcement that is known Gandhi Declaration. Announcement Act 1. First, to release Don San Suu Kyi from under house arrest immediately. Second, to find a solution by holding a dialogue between SLOP chairman and Don San Suu Kyi. Three, to, convict, to call the parliament within 60 days if Don San Suu Kyi could not be released. SLOP at the time, military gender. They call their self State Law and Order Resolution Council. Salok announced also that announcement was number one stroke 90. It says power will not be transferred to the 1990 election product parliament, but a national convention will be held to lay down guidelines for drawing constitution. And already announced that it could not accept the plan and the parliament must be called. Slok arrested NLD leader Uchi Mong, Uchi Kai, Utena, and me. NLD was divided into two groups. One group accepting Gandhi principle and other accepting Slok's one stroke 90 plan. Slok favored those who followed their one stroke 90 plan and arrested and threatened or expelled from the body those who held on to Gandhi principle. NLD had to announce it expelled Party General Secretary Don San Suu Kyi and founding fathers of parties. Government newspaper and journals published with the permission of government censorship board ran articles attacking NLD and Don San Suu Kyi. Here, the rural media should be described. While democratic forces led by NLD were being attacked. Foreign media such as VOA, BBC, RFA, DVB stood by their side. Public also re relied on the Burmese broadcast programs from those medias. They spread news and analysis by the way of mouth. People disbelieved that NLD stood by side of the truth. The attack by Slok's media made adverse effects. The more Slok media attacked Don San Suu Kyi and NLD, the more people supported Don San Suu Kyi. Slok claiming that media must be countered with media, state-owned newspaper published slogans as VOA, BBC, DVB, Arafia inciting and killing every day. Meanwhile, Slok held a national convention for constitution, they call. With 90% representative from the Slok and 10% representative from the NLD and ethnic groups, it was a sham convention. Although NLD attended convention at the beginning, Later, boycott the convention because the convention regulations were not democratic. Salok so turned theirself to become State Peace and Development Council, SPTC. And then, SPTC released Don San Suu Kyi from under house arrest in July 1995. Senior General Tan Shui led nominal meetings with Don San Suu Kyi, but not 
true and meaningful dialogues. Aung San Suu Kyi was given limited permission to improve her party. SVDC formed Union Solidarity and Development Association under the guise of social organization. With the state support and state money, the association was that association was prepared to become an anti NLD and anti Don San Suu Kyi force. On 30 May 19, 2003, and 30, on 30 May 2003, the most notorious Tabayan attack did take place. Don San Suu Kyi narrowly escaped her death. Those who announced that he would bear no crutches and hold talks by letting bygones be bygones. The government placed Don San Suu Kyi under house arrest again. Chairman U Ting U and some leaders were also put under house arrest. US and EU, United States of America, and Europe, European Union lead stronger sections, sanctions against military gender. Giving up to the pressure from the international communities, international media, military regime announced a seven-step roadmap to transfer power to democratic government. This map includes Finishing constitution, holding national referendum, holding elections, forming the government and parliament, and transferring power to the new government. Holding defiance policy against the dictatorial government, annually led by Don San Suu Kyi, stood by the people. It was local media that helped make NLDC stance to be in line with people's desire. Don San Suu Kyi's advice tolerate, don't bound down, bear all hardships, don't bound to the military data was well imprinted in the hearts of the people now it is. People from all walks of life who were supporters of democracy held on that advice while Don San Suu Kyi was under house arrest. The Saffron Revolution in 2007 is proof of the spirit of democratic and peaceful revolution. It was local and foreign media that helped strengthen that and propagate that spirit. Thanks to the youth of IT era, news on crackdown and photos on the crackdown of the monks with force during sovereign revolution spread around the world. SVTC suffered pressure from the war. In 2011, they have to change our political situation. Political changes happen in Myanmar now. Those changes now reach a reversible level. An early leader, Don San Suu Kyi, is now standing tall as a war leader. Myanmar will have to continue this effort for strengthening of democracy. Media will have to help further and really that stood by the people. Let me conclude my presentation with the saying of our democracy leader and Nobel Peace Prize winner and the friend of your leader Douglas Hover, my hero, Don Sansuji's remarks 
made in very recently American visit. Our country is on the path of new path. We are just about to start. But we are not along that way yet. And because we are just to just at the beginning, this is delicate and difficult time. And our leader asked both sides, including nationalities of our country, to call debate the culture of finding peaceful settlements by negotiation. Thank you all. Thank you, um, Huan Chang, for that uh, comprehensive overview of, of Burma's uh, history, basically, on the, the path to democracy, uh, rehearing uh, stuff from the 70s, the crackdowns, the Daipin massacre. Uh, it's part of the reason why people are so surprised at uh, the events that are happening, and uh, no one questions the NLD will be uh, a core element in the f country's future. Uh, another element uh, will be the 88 students' generation, which we are very fortunate to have one of the leaders, Coco G, uh, who will continue to kind of talk about these things in reference to the, the 88 students' generation and them as a, as a separate movement, both politically, socially, and civically, uh, and in regards to the media as well. So please, the, the floor is your Coco G. Good evening. So thanks, you all. So I really believe you all are very interested in Myanmar democratic transition. So and then the, how much important the role of media in our transformation process. So just firstly, I would like to share my experience. So at the very beginning of 1988 movement, so we have no internet, no computer, no online media. So in 1988, at least we should have some copy of machine, or just like a, how to call it, gas dinner. Some of the younger generation so can imagine a gas dinner. So, but at least we have no gas dinner. So I just bring one thing. Uh, the, I would like to show you how to make a media or how to make our communication with our people. Just, I want to show you. This is my press. <laughs> this is my printing machine. This is my copier. That's enough for our 88 generations to get. So in our Yangon University campus, so very early 1988, so our demonstration broke out in the university campus. So and then some of my friends were killed in action because of the riot police. So that we try to mention what is really happen, happening in our university campus. So we have no publication machine, press machine. So we write it down on the paper. So uh, what we want to get our demand to know the authorities or to know our people, just, we just write it down on the paper by ball band. And then so many of my students comrade copying by, by hand and hand it out to the public. So that's our very beginning of how to use the media. That's just I want to share. So in our country, very awkward situation we have come across. So just uh, if I hold a paper illegally printed, I'll have to serve seven years. This is the Illegal Press Act. And then this paper, I will, if 
I will hand out to the another. This is the Illegal Distribution Act, another seven years. So, so sometimes uh, some of my younger generations come in to the prison. So at that time, we have already served in prisons so, uh, uh, such a long time. So I ask them, hey, what's your sentence or uh, what charges you have committed? So illegal press act or illegal distribution acts. So such a younger generation, about uh, uh, 20 years old, they have served for the prison terms about 21 years. So uh, the illegal press x seven years, illegal distribution x seven years, or so and so. And then, so if you hang out in this township and go through the another township, the so same charges uh, by the, uh, the court of the another township. That's why, for those papers, so seven years, seven years, again and again. So that's why, so some of my younger generations, about 42 years or so, just a funny thing for you. But really, we actually suffering such a strange situation in our country. So just now, a little changes in our country. So that's why, and so, so our, not only the, our ADA generation students, so all of our people under severe violations of the human rights. So among those violations of the human rights, the, all of the successive rulers trying to control the media. So they assume themselves, so those media is the state-owned media. But in my mind, state, what they call the state, I don't know. The state media is private media, media for the successive ruler. So and then, so by using the, so, and acceptable rules and regulations, so we have come across. So, uh, just like a, so every deity does exercise the Orwellian <laughs> repressive measures. So, just, I was given a lengthy prison in 2005. So, that's another experience I want to share. So, in 1988, just by using only one ball pen, so I used the media. And then, so the first time I was released in 2005, so just I rashly tried to catch up the internet or email or by, uh, how to use the computer, so to try to catch up urgently. And then, so how to call it, just trying to test the internet or email. So for that reason, for each email, I've served 15 years in prison. For all together, four emails, 60 years in prison. So nobody, nobody can understand what is really happening in our country. So and then just now, some of the liberalization in our country, including the media sector. So uh, especially, after the military coup data in 1962, so those illegal press egg, or, and then the censor boat, very notorious the, in our country for all the writers. So just um, as soon as I have arrived, Brett, very amazing, too shocked for me. So each and every so many corners of the roads, the statute of the writers, authors. So how much they honor the writers and authors. In our country, most of the famous writers have been in prison, just like our political activists. So by using the unacceptable rules and regulations, so such as the electronic transition egg, and also the illegal press egg, and then they're still remaining the censor book. So if, so all of the publishers want to publish their writings, to firstly try to, uh, they will have to submit to the censor vote. And if those uh, violators 
the, the violated rules and regulations, uh, at least they will have to be banned their publication license or maximum to be in prison man. So such a situation in our country. So just now, so we can have a glimpse of hope. So 2011, the, the President Uthain Sein just uh, tried to liberalize so a little by a little. So among them, the media liberalization also. But so just now, so no need to submit to the censor board. So we can issue some of the uh, so many magazines or journals in our at the same time. So just very recently issued the 16 points guidelines. So in that guidelines, uh, the repeatedly used the, the state. But the state is so very just like a, how to call it the ghost or uh, the, <laughs> so I cannot imagine the state. So the, because of the term state, I suffer a lot. So, <laughs> so uh, to express and publish their convictions and opinions, so the, the in the existing constitution, so every citizen may exercise the right to express and publish their convictions and opinions, but some conditions they put it. And not contrary to the laws, enacted for union security, prevalence law of law and order, community peace and tranquility, or public order and morality. In practice, the laws and regulations are broadly worded and open to arbitrary or selective enforcement. So that's uh, just, I want to mention about two points. The first point is, so we are ready to appreciate the liberalization so, and some of the changes in our country. And then we need to encourage those reformists agent in the present government and also the parliament. But at the same time, we need to be cautious. Those changes are not yet institutionalized. So that's why, so we need to focus on how to make it institutionalized in our country. So just now the media liberalization or some other changes are initiated by the executive body. But to make a sustainable changes or to preserve those changes, so we need to turn our, uh, how, how do you call it, our attention to the legislative body. So those changes must be legalized or, or enacted by the legislative body. That's quite important. And then at the, at the same time, we are very used to uh, contact or de uh, touch with the media. So that's some of my views and opinions to the media. So we will have to notice also. So, for a long time, the successive rulers used the media as a tool to oppress their own people. And they tried to control all the media. So we other dissidents have no chance to handle or no chance to use the media at the same time. So that's why we just only depend on the exile media. So that's so how to call it. To make a national reconciliation, we will have to uh, diminish the ask them attitude. But our concept, from the point of the authorities, the media is as a tool to make a propaganda. And also, so in our democratic edifice, so we view the media so to counter the state media. But for the time being, very complicated, very subtle situation. So that's why we will have to, uh, how to deal the media so how to change our attitude to the media. So uh, in my mind, if our country has a full-fledged democracy, so media has to be impartial, professional. So they will have to take responsibility themselves, whatever they express in their papers or online or so and so. But just now, the problem is 
the just a little opening in our country. So we need to make a capacity buildings for our media sector and also to change the attitude of the uh, present existing government body. So that's my view. So uh, if I will tell you about my experience about the 24 years and democratization movement, so, so uh, maybe so long. So that's just, I want to finish my talks. So that's the, the role of the media is very important. Is the very accurate barometers, how much implement the democracy in the transition process. So we need to focus on the, the, to develop the role of the media and also to institutionalize the changes of the, our country and also the, we must be professional, we must be uh, the impartial. So to express what is really happening, the facts, we'll have to focus on. So that's all, the role of the media is, so how much important, so I don't want to tell you so much, so everybody knows about the role of media. So the, the role of media is still important to go ahead our transition process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kokoji, for again showing some other insights, uh, not only from personal experience about the power of the pen, but how, uh, how much trouble you could get in for very little uh, in Burma for such a long time. Uh, and the absurdity of some of the laws uh, and how they were applied. Uh, just uh, it will be touched upon, I think, uh, further on, but most of the laws that Coco G was talking about are still on the books. Uh, these are still things that uh, people could be sent to prison for uh, or still are in prison for. Uh, and so these aren't relics from the past. This is still part of Burma's present. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Coco G did point to again and again is the uh, things that are happening now and that there is now at least some sense of a push towards reconciliation, or if reconciliation is going to be possible, certain things will need to be happening. Uh, Wong Chang you know, is here representing the NLD to a certain extent. You are representing another stakeholder and powerful force in the 88 students' generation. Civil society is another important part, uh, and it's a big buzzword for the international community, for the international donor community. Uh, but, but Chao Tu is uh, the director of Panku, which is a rapidly growing civil society strengthening initiative uh, in Burma uh, and has experiences that I think sometimes are a bit different because it's not dealing just with the corridors of power but also dealing with what the reality is for parts of the country that have not yet been affected uh, by the changes. So if you could... Uh... Hello everyone. I think I, I should start with uh, what's the media like in Myanmar or Burma. The media, uh, media they we can say that there's a printed media. In printed media, uh, there are two parts. One is state-owned media. There's no new uh, state-owned media and the private media. In private media, there's no newspaper yet. And the, all the printed media are urban-based, and they, are, they have uh, best, uh, I'd say, best-selling media uh, circulation is about the 100,000 for uh, da daily prescription. And in other media, is, uh, we will call it online media, and access to online is uh, very low, and one of the lowest in the uh, world, which is about less than 2%. And the, the key users are educated, and the, again, with the urban population, and limited access to rural. And the third media, we will call it mass media, or broadcast media. Again, the, the radio and television, which are very much of state owned and the private owned. Private owned are very much up close to the government and very much uh, strictly controlled. And uh, Myanmar is a country with uh, highest in corruption, highest in human rights abuse, and lowest in access, uh, uh, lowest in access to that mobile and other IT, <coughs> IT facilities. So, and, uh, and uh, the role of media Though the, very, the limitation is very high, the role of media in the current reform is quite uh, interesting and vi uh, vibrant and moving. And civil society 
and the uh, rural and urban civil society connectedness is more visible during the Nagas. I think uh, some of you may heard about that. Over 100,000 people were killed by the uh, strong uh, cyclone. In that case, the people, uh, the civil society group from across the country, go to that the rural area. That is another way for the rural urban connection and connectedness of a civil society actors. And <coughs> The political activism of the media, printed media, started in the, it's very much related to government uh, supported 2010 election. In that case, the government want to see their election successful and legitimate. So they allow the private media to start informed about the political issue. And in that case, uh, in the civil society wisely used that spaces to use it, the political space of our private media and start uh, for more engagement, more involvement and engagement in the political process. <coughs> and uh, what I would like to, how to say, share with my experiences is the, and the interesting is, interesting thing is the daily income of a citizen is about the two dollars and the prices of our printed media, a daily newspaper is about half a dollar. So you can imagine the access to the uh, of a rural population to get these. But still, the urban-based uh, political activism are still, uh, how to say, influential in shaping the country politics. So what civil society do to get back the access to that and the influence of media? The civil society group uh, provided the rural population to mobile phone and they uh, form uh, the internet, ex uh, internet center or even they, e even they don't have afford to run an internet center, they provide the laptops and mobile phone. In that way, the access to the online and other facilities are growing. And Interesting, another thing is that, yes, as, as I mentioned, the uh, access to printed media by the rural population is very limited, so they use a photocopy machine to print out their, <coughs> to share the information that's relevant to the local community. So I would share one uh, example of how the civil society group and media work hand in hand, in which is a, uh, one of the, th that contributed to one of the turning point in the country. Most of the resources are located in the ethnic area, and this is one of the reasons of a, 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 a chronic conflict uh, between the majority Burman and the, the ethnic, ethnic community. In one part, <coughs> in Kachin ethnic area, there is a, a previous regime, regime uh, agreed to agree with the Chinese company to construct a big, mega scale hydropower dam in the area. So it was, it used to be, because the regime and the Chinese government uh, agreed to construct, it was, it used to be a very sensitive issue. The first responder of that case was Kachin population. They responded and they were cracked down severely and se seriously. And the artists and media group, what they did is they organized an art show, which is, uh, they didn't uh, mention about the name of our place. And they got, they, the first, very first art show they organized was Arts Cry Safe Soil. What they want to, the, the message is about these soils are, the quality of soils are eroded and soils, so, and the arts, uh, artists cannot stay quiet, so they uh, send out the message through media. And again, the, it is followed by arts of watershed. It is about watershed. So in that case, they bring, the, they create the space where people can discuss about the sensitive issue and media relay that message to policy maker and the, uh, powerful and scientific arguments happen. And finally, that, that was again, the, one of our key <coughs> decision maker from the government, they responded harshly to the uh, uh, responses of a civil society. And that sparked the d debate. And finally, the pre new president, Teng Sei, he decided to cancel the Nisong Dam. And after that, it, it was, a uh, wave of changes coming out from that. Another case, <coughs> in, in uh, one area that share with uh, Thailand, the, the area is called the Way Deep Seaport, Italian Thai 
group, they have invested about, they have a, a development plan about eight billion worth of the deep sea port in this real zone. The information to that project was not accessible to ordinary people or any, any business people. And the Thai, Italian Thai company have planned to build a 4,000 megawatt coal power plant, which is very, uh, how to say, environmentally and socially, economically quite uh, controversial uh, uh, project. So what we, so we mean, civil society did, is the, the media visited the uh, coal power plant in Thailand, and they reported back to the population inside. This is a, this is a, I would say, issue related to coal power plant. And the local community learned about that, and they finally staged a campaign, and the, finally the government decided to cancel the, that 4,000 megawatt. This is an example of how media and civil society walk hand in and that issue. And as I mentioned, in the, after 2010, the political activism of a civil society or political engagement of a civil society is growing. In previous region, they, they, how to say, they pretend that they are not politically involved. But all the actors of civil society are very much social minded and politically minded, politically oriented. Now they use the spaces to <coughs> better involve in that. So now the current, how to say, key issue, uh, not uh, Burmese uh, country like you, uh, in a reform, when you like a uh, open a dustbin, every uh, smell are coming out. So every, everywhere issues are coming out. So uh, the issues are a kind of a way of wise of a civil society and the role of a media is they carry and delay that message to the respective uh, actors. It can be a government, it can be a position, it can be a legislation. Or it, there's still a uh, judiciary system is still a, uh, not a vibrant one, but still, uh, and also to the international community. This is how the media and civil society work in hand. So what other opportunity in the, how to say, what I, what I mentioned about uh, some limitation and how civil society work. What is there, what are the opportunity in improving that limitation? Burma will be the focal country for communication for or in for 2013 for ASEAN, that the government will definitely improve the internet access and the access to mobile. That can, civil society can take advantage of it. And Burma will host 20, uh, the ASEAN chair in 2014 is another opportunity. And the 2015, the after and other things coming up. So it's a kind of a opportunity. And in 1950, in 50 and 60 and 70, in, Burma has a history of uh, enjoy the freedom of media, where the product of how do you say strong, the narratives are still have a high influence for today's democratic movement. The uh, literary, uh, literary society, poet society, they create a very strong narrative. So another opportunity for the coming uh, uh, coming years will be now. There's an opening up of media. The, li the literary society and civil society and, and artists and media, can they play a role or to create and develop a strong narrative like the pro-poor pro -poor policy, pro-spiritual policy that can be very contributive positively to the democratic reform. Yeah, this is all I want to share about my reflection of media and civil society. Uh, thank you very much, Chao Tu. Uh, I think, again, there's a number of things, obviously, that could be talked about from the comments you made about uh, the Mitzon Dam project and the government uh, seeming to starting to uh, recognize public opinion or the pressure that the public can bring to bear on the government, uh, amongst a number of other things. Uh, but I want to give the floor now to, to Ong Zhou uh, so that he can talk about the, the role of the Irrawaddy and the work that he's done as a journalist uh, cross-border and also the, the meaning that it has for people inside the country, both uh, over the last 20 plus years uh, and today as things are starting to change? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, uh, let me share great news. Burma is going through the transition. And in 24 years, 
I went back to my home town, Yangon, for the first time this year. This itself is demonstrate that uh, this change is taking place in our country. But also we also need, after I hear that I heard the three people speaking, that we need a tone of caution or change taking place in our country. Because transition can be stalled, transition can be failed, or transition maybe have a abortion where we couldn't go anywhere if not reverse. So I think we all should have a very, I think, intelligent uh, uh, monitoring system somehow to look through, not to get too excited, but to pay more attention to what is taking place and the need of this transi transition in our country. And I want to share my finding when I go back to my country four times. First visit, I was given a five days visa, and second, second trip, I got a seven days visa, a bit of improvement. And a third visit, I got 10 days visa. <laughs> and a fourth visit, they gave me a uh, two weeks visa. So I think it's, 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 it's coming slowly. If you look at it, <laughs> if you look at it, and uh, you can really see that uh, measurement of uh, the change taking place in our country. So don't get too excited. And then don't, don't be gold rush, and then, and then I will go along with you, but slowly, slowly, okay? And uh, I, think, I think I find that uh, the, the media last 24 years has been embedded with the opposition. And there has been a comfort zone between the opposition, uh, NLD, or Donald San Suu Kyi, or, or 88, or, or other activists and the media. There has been a comfort zone. But I think, I noticed that that comfort zone has been breaking up, particularly this year. Why? Because political opening in our country. If you look at the two very important issues taking place in this year, one in fighting in Kachin states, the other one is in Rohingya issue. The international press and AR itself and other media are very critical and very vocal towards Aung San, to Aung San Suu Kyi and, uh, and other activists who've been very silent on this issue. So I think this comfort zone is no longer exist. I think it, the media inside and outside the country were more vibrant and maybe much more stronger and it were, should have played a more independent role, I think. And a position member should respect the role of the media. Doesn't matter whether it is transition period or full-fledged democracy, or it wouldn't matter. I think that has to be acknowledged. Second, the government, watch out, I would say. They're very savvy. If you look at the President Deng Tsai uh, press conference held last week, he held two hours press conference with the uh, local press. He was very comfortable. He was very honest. He was very candid. He, he accepted. Even not even, I, I'm talking to this morning to my, my, my colleague my, from America, I was talking to her that uh, even in the State Department or in the White House, you have to have a, a you know, precondition or some kind of question being, being proposed, what question you're going to ask. Then, uh, then the president will come to the podium and you know, point the finger and then answer the question. And President Tang Sei gives you full two hours and ask whatever question you want to ask. He answered. Very sophisticated, very savvy. I think the position camp or, or other sympathizer camp is falling apart, is my observation. And the government is very, very, very clever. And always wherever I go, I heard who are giving advice to them. Because it is really a turning point. Burma is facing watershed. Because, because they are the same people that, who refuse to listen. But they are the same people who took out their uniform and wear longji like Wong Jai. And uh, I don't have any other example to show. But uh, <laughs> you know, you know that, uh, I think same people, but they are listening, which is a very good, very good thing, I think. It's very encouraging. But uh, I, my point is they're very, 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 very clever. So uh, the dissident media, or even we were labeled as a dissident media in the past, we are now open in the office in Yango. But our strategy 
as I always said, is one full in and a one full out strategy. Why? If you may ask, because security reason, we don't know we're going to burn the bridge. We don't know what will happen. Our benchmark will be 2015. You know how transparent the election is going to be? Who is going to win? Will they be cheated again? Are they going to fix the outcome like 2010? So th these are the issues that we, lo we look at, that we set our benchmark very high before you're going to fully invest your resources. And we don't want to see ourselves sitting in prison like Kokoji, you know, 20 years, 30 years again. So I think we are very, very cautious about it. But at the same time, we're very encouraged of this opening in the country. And uh, the civil society groups, the opposition, government itself, the minister, more and more accessible to uh, the information or interviews, you just name it. But underneath, there are a lot of story being untold. And then what happened in Kachin states, in ethnic areas, the human rights violation, the rape uh, uh, against a woman, and the corruption, scandals. There are a lot of uh, Burma North Korea connection, and Burma relationship with China. There are a lot of stories that, that local media still cannot able to report or don't even know how to report it because of there has been very, it's a dangerous term because of uh, self-censorship and uh, it's a prevailing attitude that uh, the people, uh, reporters, they don't dare to write the real stories inside the country. So this is a, one of the reasons also that we decided to keep the, our office outside of Burma and to keep reporting. And also, uh, Dr. Chordu was very, he was very elaborated and very eloquent about uh, civil society and media, the role of the media. I think the one thing is uh, we're missing is also ethnic media. Inside the country, since we have, uh, we have uh, you know, several ethnic minor minorities, the media inside the country is very much urban, very much uh, urban-based uh, media. I very much narrowly focus on, as you all know, what is, ha what is going on in Nipido and uh, Yangon. That's it. Beyond that, there are very little story uh, reporting in local media or outside. So this is one thing that I think uh, we should pay more attention. We should also pay more attention to, I think, uh, investigative reporting. So I think there's, there's an international community which can play a role to assist, to empower the local young reporters and bureau journalists, citizen journalists, whatever you call it, that there are a lot of stories to be told. What happened in Kachin State? What happened in Kachin State? Poverty and corruption cases. And government's claiming that they have no money. But where are the gas money? Where are the three billion, four billion? How they built the Nipido? Where the money came coming from? You know, these are the stories that need to be need to be told. I think told uh, inside and outside audience. I think international community should be, I think, uh, more vigilant and more careful because of this morning in a one panel I, I mentioned that it was very interesting to see the international community or international media, Western media was very uh, hardline say that until until two years ago, whenever I talk about Tan Shui or and you know what happened in, in ethnic areas. But suddenly they been become a very tame, they become very soft, and they change the tune and tone completely. Doesn't mean that uh, Burma has free. Burma as in, isn't free yet to me. It's Burma is maybe partially free. Or we have we have to wait for another a decade to see the Burma is going to emerge like a a truly a democratic nation. And uh, so I think th th these are the issues that I think uh, uh, we should look into it. And so a long list of things to do. I will be very happy to open you know, your question and, and uh, I think I will stop here. Otherwise I can keep talking, talking, I will finish. Thank you very much. Um, but before we kind of open it up for questions, since we've got the four panelists, I'm curious to see if any of them would like to respond uh, to each other's comments.
But I, I do want to pick up on a couple of things that uh, were mentioned. I mean, one, obviously, I think everyone that's concerned about Burma is looking forward to 2015 as the real benchmark about how deep or true the changes are. Because even though people are surprised by what's happened, a lot of the, the changes haven't required the government to give up very much, uh, whereas in 2015, much more is at stake. Uh, but you also mentioned, uh, and a few other people did, one, the lack of capacity because of Burma being so closed uh, for so long. Uh, but then also the, the threat of self-censorship. And for each of the panelists here, the government maybe already has a victory because a dialogue has been initiated on some level for each of you to participate in the future of the country. So maybe each of you can speak a little bit to the, the danger of self-censorship in a country like Burma. Uh, because after the history, it, it's something that each of you has to maybe contend with in, in your own particular way. And after that, uh, I would open it up to the floor. Any kind of like to start, or whoever would like to start, it's free. <laughs> or if no one wants to start, we can go right to the questions from the audience. I mean, I'm, I, I, know, I know we have a lot of people here. There's a two-two generation. I would say that the self-censorship, the mentality is more with the self-censorship mentality is more with the older generation. People or younger generations are more, how to say, outspoken and they are more, how to say, confident to speak out about their opinions. So, and the current printed media journalists are younger generation. I think the, if, uh, and they are also uh, quite. Uh, ch challenge the uh, old uh, trend of uh, self-censorship of uh, old, uh, old, uh, older generation about it. So I think the the tra uh, trend is changing from positive. And the uh, uh, online media, yes, as, as I mentioned, the access to online media are very limited. The most of the, how to say, age group access to are educated, and the, the younger group. So there is no censorship in that the about the news and they are sharing their opinion. So I think it's on uh, towards a positive direction. Yeah. You would ask us to respond or would you like to use questions from the audience? If you could talk about censorship, I think. Uh, well, well, censorship is, you know, it's, 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 I think even though censorship board has been, has been, uh, uh, stop activating, I would say. It's not has to be abolished. They stay there. You have to. You have to go through. You still have to submit. Uh, uh, you know, post materials that uh, publication do to, to them. And uh, and last week, uh, one of the very famous editorial cartoonists, uh, Han Lei, he used to be our editorial cartoonist. His drawing was published for the first time in Myanmar Times newspaper. And uh, it was about, uh, it was very tiny tease towards uh, military. It was President Thaisen was releasing the bird. And, and, and the military man behind was with a gun shooting the bird. You know, as, uh, you know, it's, uh, so which is shooting down the piece, uh, you know, how to call it in English uh, phrase. Uh, anyway, uh, then the so next day, you could see that, uh, uh, the Myawadi, the military-owned newspaper, came out with this very stern warning towards uh, this uh, cartoon. They're saying that this is very insensitive, and uh, but I see that it was very condescending and very blatant, blatant interference towards uh, ongoing fragile transition process. We wouldn't accept such an interference from the military. Because, because we always see this military as a very patronizing, very condescending, that who think they are the guardians of the nation, who knows everything, who want to fix the country, which is not true. They have mismanaged, they have corrupted, they have pickpocketed, they have stealed everything. And the, one of the richest countries become bankrupt because of, not because of me or you or sitting here, it's because of the military. I, I think this, this is the thing that they, they, they couldn't really stand it. So I think, I think even that small, uh, small drawing is, 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 is touched a raw nerve of, uh, of uh, the military means that uh, 
the big brother is really playing a role and they keep watching, they monitor everything. They're very sophisticated, even if you look at the Ministry of Information, they are session that who monitor. They are whistleblower who feed me information every night. What's going on inside the Ministry of Information? And there was a one 12 pages report I read recently. It said that uh, how to effectively use the soft power. Thanks to the soft power. And uh, they, they know how to use the soft power. They no longer come to reprimand you or, you know, but this is how they're trying to, trying to send a message to inside and outside. The military stay there. We don't know how the military is going to act in, in, in future politics. And even now they have a 25% stake in the parliament. So I think, I think the censorship outside of Burma, the Western press and the wire services said, oh, no more censorship. Also, oh, you're great. Why are you keeping the office in, in Chiang Mai? Why don't you go home? I said, would you guarantee that if I'm being locked up in prison? You know, you know there are, they are increased lawsuits. We are thinking to have a, a, a legal a lawyer. A lot of publications inside the country are thinking to have a lawyer. Because, because there are backdoor encouragement from the government ministries to sue, the, to sue, the, to sue the reporters and their publications. Of course, there are also problems with the reporters who think they can abuse not only to use the freedom and to, to expose, to do the exposure of the corruption cases. But at the same time, they just deliberately, you know, misusing the freedom by defaming the people. And uh, I mean, they may not even, so there are a lot of cases uh, coming. I think there are more cases that will be coming because sometimes you don't really know where the, draw, where the line has been drawn. And this cartoon and this one shown again that there is a boundary. And you know where you can, where you can go and where, how far you can go, I think. Excuse me. So now in the, the role of media, or the situation of media in Burma is very complicated, I would like to see. Because government announced very notorious censor boot was abolished. But many journals issued today have to submit copies after printing, not the full printing, after printing. Who was that? I don't know. Maybe their own eyes. And at the time, government announced panel of ex journalists to supervise the publications and journals and other publications. At the same time, after the announcement, journalists who own the now the publications announced they couldn't accept that panel because uh, m most of the members of the panels are pro government. I don't know what happened. Also, government announced they are trying to draft a media law. What will be the outcome? I don't know. Therefore, the situation is very complicated. I have to say, uh, and the modern media such as Twitter, something, uh, YouTube, GTalk, Facebook, now spread and are spreading in Parma, but mostly in urban areas. And it is second largest party in parliament now. But even NLE can afford to provide computer, computer trainings in our state and division organizing committee headquarters. We can afford. Very expensive in Parma. It's very limited. Even 
a mobile phone less expensive is worth two hundred dollars in Burma. Therefore, modern media now it is very limited in Burma. Therefore, we have to try uh, to use the freedom of press in Burma uh, starting from now. That I have to say. Thank you. Kokoji, if I could just, uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions because uh, Jacob Klepau came down just as a reminder to, to make sure that people had time to get to the closing ceremony. Uh, so I would like to have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, so all I can ask is please uh, try to keep the questions very direct. Uh, and if you are addressing it to a particular panel member, please let them know. So, uh, Kinlay. I'm Kinley from Burma. I'm not asking you, the panelists, I just add some more opinions of mine. Because I and my husband also published a man monthly magazine in our country. So we are used to with such circumstances that the gentleman mentioned. So, but I like to clear the present situation of the me uh, our local media, I mean private media. Although they said that we have a, a little bit freedom of expression or freedom of thought, something like that. But I like to point it out that most of the media in our country, a printed media and broadcasting media, including TV and radio and FN also, but mostly are owned by the former generals, family and the cronies. So. It does not mean that it is the freedom of expressions we can have, but it means that although Don San Suu Kyi movements and activities and 88 generation movement we can express in our day, uh, weekly journals, it is not for the sake of our people. It is for the sake of their souls. So this is one of the points I like to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Kinlay. Uh, is there another question? Well, you can pass it to So Ong. So on uh, Burmese exile, living outside of Burma 24 years uh, in Thailand. Uh, my comment here is that uh, the censorship, uh, self-censorship that uh, uh, many of you mentioned uh, here in the panel is not only in the uh, media, but also uh, in terms of the, uh, the changes which is taking place in the country. As Guangzhou mentioned that uh, the international uh, media stopped reporting you know, what is happening inside the country, the dark side of the, uh, the, the stories uh, overnight. And uh, they are focusing more on the, uh, the uh, brighter side of the uh, uh, stories in the country. And it's not only happening with the uh, international media and the international government or the institutions or NGOs, but also it's happening inside the country. You know, the, uh, the organizations, the uh, political parties, the uh, activists, uh, civil society organizations and so on and so forth. But uh, we understand that, that there are very much limitation that they can move forward, you know, like uh, uh, under the circumstances. But uh, uh, I would like to point out that, that this is also a very important point, that uh, if you are not leading uh, to uh, show that, to, to shed that light to the people, people will not be uh, following on the right path to bring about change in our country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Is there another question that uh, someone would have? We have, uh, again, just a little bit of time, but obviously there's a lot of issues that have been mentioned. Uh, uh, Pavel? Uh, I have a question for uh, Wong Chang, whether he could just very briefly say how much freedom does he enjoy as a member of the existing parliament? We know it's the first parliament since the previous one had been suspended, so the first one in more than 20 years, uh, do you have a complete immunity uh, for your parliamentary uh, speeches? Do, uh, or are there certain red lines that you're not supposed to cross? Is there pressure on you from the new leadership? Thank you. We, I have to say, I would like to say we, we got not the most, but more freedom in Parliament. Nobody did take us how to, how to present or how to put issues. Uh, there must be two, there must be two, there had been, 
They are not being in Parliament now. <laughs> but uh, we started our present in Parliament uh, at the fourth regular sessions. Up to third regular sessions, uh, the member of USDB itself, him themselves, told us that there's no mm, much uh, liberal in Panama in, in, in first uh, three sections. Uh, they also thanks us because you, you are, you are entirely in Parliament, came in the Parliament, uh, we also have a lot of uh, freedoms to speak uh, some, some, some sort of that. Because I think our leader, Don San Suu Kyi, is very persuasive. It's a her uh, excellence power. I think. And most of the multi personals who uh, present as a member of parliament, sent it by CNC, Chief of Staff, or General May Online. Also, uh, very friendly to our leader. They, <laughs> they show their face and even someone uh, meet Dong San Suu Kyi and <clears throat> say their opinions very openly. Therefore, I think we, we have some freedoms in Parliament. Uh, so we have time for one more question, uh, if someone would like to ask, ask one. Uh, Igor? of the reports or papers about the soft power and uh, is there some let's say strategists uh, within the government or within the regime let's say and if yes where they are let's say where, where do they sit do they sit in a president's office or do they sit in a, in a military or, or who is now the strategist for the go for the government one question and the second question is uh, uh, here in a in a in a, in a, in a East Europe, let's say mainly, let's say where transition started and then never happened, and what we get is a kind of the semi-authoritarian regimes which uh, have then survived comfortably until today in most of the places. What really happened in the media is that, that you get the kind of the liberalization what you are, what you are what we are seeing now happening in Burma. But at the same time, parallel to that, basically the oligarchs close to the political power has occupied the media space. So, and then through the occupation of the media space, through the basically oligarch money, let's say the, whatever freedom you get, you basically, let's say, cannot deliver through the media, media freedom because the media space is occupied by the power of the money which is directly connected with the interest of the, of the, of the polit political power, let's say. And do you see something like that happening uh, in a bar mine? When I say media, then I mean, mean mainly broadcasting, broadcasting media because this is where the real influence is. Uh, all right, uh, keep it tight because of, we all have to go. I think, I think a great question. It's a great question. I think oligarchy and the soul power, they all there. They all sit in there. The president office and beyond the president office. They all there, strategist, advisor. One pity thing is Donald San Suu Kyi doesn't even have a, such a half of the members of the advisor or, or oligarchy who, is, who are behind her. There are people around her, but perhaps. But that, that's the irony that I find it in Burma that the president thing saying, and uh, he is mild manner. I think he may be a very honest person, a former general. I think he's quite honest, candid. But there are people around him who play very, very uh, savvy and very sophisticated game in, in public relations uh, as well. So uh, I think they are sitting there. I've met them. I met uh, not only the reformists, I also met the performists inside the country. And this is your question to you, uh, my answer to you. And an oligarchy, yes, in media, and a crony, as she, as she mentioned, there, we are going to dangerous, dangerous trend. That which the other donors or some international community ambassador don't, couldn't, couldn't comprehend, which is, which is there are six giant media inside the country are owned by former military leaders. 
And if you are rich, if you're powerful, you can have a press freedom in Burma. If not, forget about it. So this, this is a dangerous trend in oligarchy uh, controlling the, the media space inside that country. They are detecting, and they're determined to stay there. They're detecting, and they can swallow me at AOD within a one minute. We have nothing. We have nothing. Uh, okay, I think the, obviously the conversation could go on for a lot longer, but uh, part of why they're encouraging people that are here in particular to go to the closing is there's a closing message from Aung San Suu Kyi uh, that Forum 2000 has received, and so I don't want to uh, deny people with clear uh, interest in Burma the chance to, to get some remarks from her. But I would like to thank one more time the four panelists. Thank you for... Uh,